This is the last time that we are in the Gospels, but it is very interesting. The 21st chapter of John is fascinating because Jesus Christ shows up again. And he deals with this problem of Peter. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembry. I'm Janice. This is Quick Study Television, taking you through the Bible as we study this today. It is going to be a good one, so stay there. Corey, what are you doing? I'm taking a look at something called the Nazareth inscription. That's very good. Excellent, Corey. I look forward to that. What did we do today? Well, today's fabulous Friday, so that means we have a question ending off... John chapter 21. A question on a Fabulous question. Friday. All right, well, there you go, Ryan. We're going to have to answer questions. Well, Ryan, what are you doing? Well, today I'm responding to a commonly asked Bible question about the psalmist David, and that is, how could King David, a man of many sins, be regarded in the Bible as a man after God's own heart? Good question. Get your Bible in your Bible guide because it is time to study. Today, you and I are going to be focusing in on an artifact called the Nazareth inscription. Now, of course, there's a little bit of a scholarly debate over the Nazareth inscription as it wasn't found in an official archeological excavation. It was found on the antiquities market many years ago. Now it has been authenticated, so it's not a forgery, but because of the, uh, the origins of it are unknown, there's a little bit of a debate. Take a look. An ancient Greek inscription, today called the Nazareth inscription, may be a response of the Roman Empire to claims of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This marble inscription was bought on the antiquities market in 1878, then acquired by the Paris National Library in 1925, where it finally received scholarly translation and attention. The inscription says, Edict of Caesar, it is my decision concerning graves and tombs, whoever has made them for the religious observances of parents or children or household members, that these remain undisturbed forever. But if anyone legally charges that another person has destroyed or has in any manner extracted those who have been buried or has moved with wicked intent those who have been buried to other places, committing a crime against them, or has moved sealing stones against such a person, I order that a judicial tribunal be created. You are absolutely not to allow anyone to move those who have been entombed, but if someone does, I wish that violator to suffer capital punishment. The scenario described by the inscription seems peculiar for a few reasons. It seems to work well only in a Jewish family tomb scenario. The most common method of Gentile Greek and Roman burials was the internment of cremated remains in individual graves or mausoleums located in cemeteries. There are no known examples of Roman family tombs. Sealing stones were also only used in Jewish family tombs from before AD 70. Also peculiar is the crime being described. Bodies are being moved with malicious intent, not sold or defaced, simply moved. If this inscription was issued in Nazareth, where Jesus was known to be from, before AD 70, that places it in the perfect time and place to be compared with the rapidly growing Christian movement. Christian Jews claimed that Jesus has risen from the dead and pointed to his empty tomb. The high priests, on the other hand, yelled, stolen body. Perhaps Rome responded by clarifying their position, extreme penalties for moving bodies out of their final resting places. Now, there is a debate between some scholars whether the Nazareth inscription should properly be understood as an official reaction or response to the resurrection claim of Jesus Christ and the burgeoning Christian religion that, that was spreading like wildfire in the Roman province of Judea, or if it should be properly understood as be coming from a time period a little bit before the execution and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, the biblical significance for it, if it came beforehand, would be it, this really would up the stakes for the disciples. You know, it really would have made, uh, you know, grave robbing literally out of the question. However, I don't really see any precedent to see this coming before the, the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ, especially because no other artifacts like this have been found so far. So I think it's a little bit of, you know, uh, stretching the truth a little bit, uh, trying to make it more convenient for people to say, you know, well, 
Jesus, his, crucif- his, his resurrection never really happened. They like to kind of push it before. It's possible. But I think personally right now, until we find another artifact or something else that provides a little bit more context for the Nazareth inscription, I think it's pretty safe to see this as an official response to the claims of Christians that Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead and the claims from the high priest that his grave was just robbed. You know, the Lord continued showing his disciples that he was alive. The men didn't know what to do or say in his presence. I mean, what would you do or I do or say? Well, John explained that Jesus was showing them something that they needed to know, not by just showing up, by spending time with them. At times, we do not want to face Jesus Christ head on because we're embarrassed or we're upset but we must give everything to God. John 21 revealed Peter needed closure for his denial of Christ three times. How Jesus Christ did this was very important. Everything we ever do, God has seen. You see, Jesus Christ understands how God forgives us, but we must also know that the way Christ introduces himself is covered in this section. John 21, verses 1 through 14. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and in this way he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathanael of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we're going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, Children, have you any food? They answered him, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast And now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, and plunged into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from land, but about two hundred cubits, dragging the net with fish. Then, as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish which you have just caught. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land, full of large fish, one hundred and fifty-three. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. Jesus said to them, Come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them and likewise the fish. This is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. John chapter 21 verses 1 through 14. You know, John 21 is a great passage of scripture. This is the last time we're going to be in this gospel for this year. And uh, we're gonna carry on with Acts and so on. But listen carefully, this, I'm just gonna go later in the chapter so we can see this. Listen carefully, I'm gonna read this. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus, the risen Jesus, said to Simon Peter. Now they hadn't talked about his denial of Christ back before when Christ was being crucified. 
But Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Then he said, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Then Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Jesus Christ forgave Simon three times for the three times he turned him down. That was amazing. You see, God has a way of finishing things we started. Beloved, we need to pay attention to this. It's very important because many of us today have denied Christ. And we need to understand that we can come back to Christ. We need to do that. And as we do, get your Bible guide out. We're going to look at it. If you don't have a Bible guide, you can write to us. The addresses are at the bottom of the screen. Or go to www.biblediscoverytv.com and click on Donate. Make a donation in any amount, and God will will uh, bless you, and then we'll send you the guide. Now listen carefully, because as we begin to read this chapter, we need to understand that God is speaking to us. Jesus shows up. Jesus shows up. I mean, you know, he's there. Now he's been crucified, and he's risen from the dead. And I mean, this is amazing. John chapter 20 to 21 is what we read. John chapter 21, 1 to 14, Father, I pray that the Holy Spirit would speak to us. Open our hearts, help us to hear you and see you. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Listen carefully to the scripture, very important. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. I've been there, it's a great place. And in this way, he showed himself. This is the way he did it. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana of Galilee, in Galilee, sons of Zebedee, and the two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, well, we're going to go with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. I mean, it was, no fish were anywhere. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, children, children, have you any food? And they answered him, no. And he said to them, then cast your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. What is this? He's not even in the water with them. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw the net because of the multitude of fish. This is amazing. You see, every time the Lord tells us something, (laughs) it happens as he says it will. Sooner or later, it's going to happen. That happened with Jonah. God did not wipe them out in Nineveh, but, you know, he did 150 years later with Nahum. Jesus Christ does not sponsor failures. You know, Jesus Christ is not a sponsor who puts together a failure. God doesn't do that, beloved. God always does things in his will and things that are right. That's why we need to get ourselves aligned with the Lord. That's what we need to do because he does things that are always right. Doesn't matter, political partners, doesn't matter. That's not our God. Our God is Jesus Christ, beloved. We look to the Lord and we say, Lord, what do you want me to do? How am I to respond? How am I to vote? How am I to do these things? I will respond to you, Lord. Nobody else in this world but you. Very important. We need to hear that. We need to understand that. Look at John 27 or 21 verse 7. It says, therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, that's John. Jesus loved John as he did all of them, it is the Lord. Now, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, and plunged into the sea. He just jumped into the sea. (laughs) But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they're not far from the land, but about 200 cubits, dragging the net with fish. Then as soon as they had come to the land, they saw a fire of coals, 
and there fish laid on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have caught. Bring it here. Oh my goodness, are you serious? This is how Jesus revealed himself. Jesus Christ focuses on our work for him. This is what is important to the Lord. Because, how do I say this? Right now, we're talking about doing what God wants and doing his work. But God is saying, I'm more interested in who you are than what you've done. Who are you with me? Who we are, who we become, that's the most important thing. When we do the work of the Lord, God is able to change us. He's able to work with us. But if we're just doing the work, I don't know if that's the right thing. But if we do the work of the Lord, that's the right thing. It says in John chapter 21, verse 11, Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to the land full of large fish, 153. There's a number there. We can look that up later. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They didn't do that, knowing that it was the Lord. Well, Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them. And likewise, the fish, this now, this is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Now, three times the Lord shows it. See, the Lord works with us. God works with us when we do things for him. We are not alone. We're not alone. That is what the Bible tells us. Whenever we work and we say, Lord Jesus Christ, I need to follow you. I need to do it. And business owners might say that. I, I would encourage you to do that, business owner. To run your business and run things as the Lord says. Politicians, I would encourage you to do that too. Run everything according to what the Lord says to you. So your relationship with God becomes the main thing. When you say, Jesus Christ, come into my life and be Lord, that's the main thing. He changes you from the inside out. And I'll tell you something, when we do that, the, the outside world begins to change in a good way. Something we should think about. Next time, the question is, we are testing God. Does God know when we lie to him? Well, we'll talk about that and more next time on Quick Study Television. Right now, Ryan. Well, today I'm responding to a Bible question which has been asked by many critics and Christians alike, and it's this. How could King David, a man who committed some pretty great sins, be regarded in the Bible as a man after God's own heart and one whose heart was perfect before him? Well, let's take a closer look at the relevant passages. Due to its offensive nature, many attempts have been made to discredit the Bible as the Word of God. For example, critics ask how King David, a man of many sins, could be regarded in the Bible as a man after God's own heart, and one whose heart was perfect before him. In both 1 Kings 11.4 and 15.3, we read that David's heart was considered to be perfect before the Lord. And according to 1 Samuel 13.14 and Acts 13.22, God also considered David to be a man after his very own heart. It is very true that even before David became king of Israel, he had committed several sins and offenses to his discredit. 
such as his deception of the high priest Ahimelech, which resulted in the massacre of nearly every priest in the city of Nob by the agents of King Saul. Most famously, David is known for his affair with Bathsheba and the subsequent murder of her husband Uriah. How then could David, a man of such iniquity, be credited with a perfect heart? First important to note is the Hebrew word used in 1 Kings 11.4 and 15.3. It is shalem, which has been translated as perfect in the King James Bible, but can also be rendered as wholly devoted or fully devoted, since the word's basic meaning is complete, whole, sound, finished, or even at peace with someone. Also, the scriptures reveal that one is not required to be completely sinless in order to be one after God's own heart. If this was so, then no one could be considered as such, since all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. One of the main reasons David was considered a man after God's own heart was because his central purpose was to glorify God and not himself. The glory of God, the will of God, and the loving fellowship of God were what mattered most to him. David knew how to trust God's grace and forgiving love enough to confess and forsake his iniquity in an attitude of true repentance. We see here that for us to be one after God's own heart does not require us to be sinless, since this would obviously be impossible. Remember, the Apostle Paul reminds us in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So what is required of us to be considered one after God's own heart? Well, David was the biblical example. As I mentioned, it was his attitude towards God. David wanted to glorify God first. David also admitted when he was wrong and didn't make excuses. He accepted the punishment. The late Old Testament scholar Gleason Archer, in considering the incident with Bathsheba and Uriah, observed that Psalm 32 reveals what unbearable agony that David went through after the affair with Bathsheba, until finally the prophet Nathan came to him and condemned his crimes in the name of Yahweh. Now, a lesser man would have flared up against this daring prophet and had him put to death. But one of the greatest assets in David's character was his ability to receive rebuke, to acknowledge his utter sinfulness, and to cast himself on the mercy of God to forgive him, cleanse him, and restore him to holy fellowship once more. Here we have an example, not of an error or contradiction, but of the amazing mercy of God and how we too can be men and women after God's own heart. I think it's important to remember that David is considered by the Bible and considered by God. I mean, when they introduced the Bible, the rest of the Bible, uh, and the kings to the people, and they said, well, the kings of Judah, they said, well, he did what his father David did. David mm -hmm. was considered to be a great king for that reason. He was a measure, yeah, he for was. the rest of the kings. They kind of measured that, them up and against him, yeah. And, you know, I think when Jesus came, that changed in for some who believed that Jesus mm -hmm. was Messiah. And I think it's important that we understand that, that Jesus Christ is the king. Mm -hmm. the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And so that's very interesting, mm -hmm. Ryan. Thank you so much. What did you do? It's our fabulous Friday question. I yeah. thought you were just going to be expounding on for a while. <laughs> he no. forgot. He I, I, because forgot. I always, it was Friday. You always tell me, you know, you, well, that's enough that you're stalling. I'm not stalling anymore. <laughs> that's wonderful. We got several minutes and we're here. We're going <laughs> to... So if you guys get it wrong, they're going to look in... They're going to see you and you're going to be embarrassed. Okay. Now we have Thank not we have not seen the teaching today. No. Yeah. So we're going to be trying to answer this yeah. cold. <laughs> cold, because we're working ahead. So that's, that's what right. a lot of people don't that's realize. That's what I used to do, and I never got mm -hmm. I never got excuses no like that. No. no. No sympathy. In and fact, I did the question for years too. Remember? She did. Remember? Well. Oh yeah. yeah. You did. Okay. Well, I, I give you points for that, but but they they called it whining. Yes. Well, I wasn't yeah. whining. Mm -hmm. well, it was pretty close. It was, it was, it was there close. actually many yeah. times it, to be truthful. Sorry, but Dad. This chapter, chapter 21 of John, has to be one of my favorites. To me, it's just most endearing. It's even titled in the New King James, King James Breakfast by the Sea. First of all, I love breakfast. That sounds nice. You know, so yeah. doesn't that sound lovely? It sounds very and nice. And Jesus <laughs> is showing up to his disciples, and it's just so, it is so endearing because they're out in the boat, and you know, he tells them to cast the net into the to the other side of the boat, which is what he did when he was in Peter's boat. And it just would have, you know, it was just so wonderful because they would have known 
that it was Jesus mm -hmm. by the different things. And then, you know, Peter grabs his outer clothing. He just jumps right into the sea. I love Peter. You know, he just jumps right in because he's just so excited that, uh, they're it's, far that from, it's Jesus. Like they're far from land. They're like 200 meters. 200 so. yards, I think. He's a fisherman. <laughs> yeah. He's used to the water. He's all right. He's all right. <laughs> yeah, he's all right. And, but, you know, he, maybe he thought that he would walk on water again. Maybe. Jesus, like, if it's possible. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's possible. Because, and, and here he just, I can only imagine what he's feeling on the inside because let's face it, he had denied Christ three yeah. times. And here was Jesus coming back to actually draw that back out of him to let him know that not once, not mm. twice, but for the three times that Peter denied him, Jesus forgave him. Mm -hmm. And I just, the whole, this whole scene is just beautiful. It's just wonderful. And then of course they eat breakfast together. Oh, I love it. But that's not my question. <laughs> my question <laughs> is about the disciples that were there who got to actually experience this breakfast with Jesus by the sea. Oh, so I'm no. wondering if you can tell me you do not have to name them, but oh. you do have to number them. Number them? You how need many? to tell me how many of Jesus' disciples were actually there for breakfast oh, by I don't the remember. sea. A bunch of people are looking in their Bibles I know right they now. are, and that's yeah, okay. I wish I it could. Is an open, it is an open book test. Not for us. <laughs> well, not for you. No, don't you look at I know. <laughs> the people do, though. You know. I don't remember. Do you remember? It's a wonderful number. I, uh, seven, three. then, or three? Three or yeah. seven, right? Definitely three, because you've got the three fishermen. Yeah. Definitely three. I, I would guess. That's, that would be my guess. Three? Yeah. Oh, Dad Dad just gave us the seven. Dad just oh. gave us a... He, he just went Are like this. Are you cheating? Yeah. I didn't cheat. I'm being just, honest about okay, well. it. I'm being honest about it. We we guessed three or seven, and yeah, he's okay. encouraging seven, so we're going to go with seven. Or is ten a nice number? Ten is a three nice number. Three plus seven is ten. Yeah, are you helping us or are you just trying I, to? I, wow. She's going to look at me now. I can't. I'm lost now. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm lost. I, um, was it today's program that God knows what you do? You were I, talking about you can't I, I, lie to God and you can't. Oh, no. Can't this is God. going down a dark path. Yeah. <laughs> and with one minute left, what's your final answer? If you phone a friend mm. or look at a friend. Okay. And <laughs> okay. Are I'm you, giving are you, you all confident? the hints I'm going to give. Okay, seven. I think okay, seven. Sure. Seven? Yeah. Seven. Let's count them. Simon Peter. Yeah. Thomas called the twin. Yeah. Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee. The sons of Zebedee, which would be James and John. Yeah. And two others of his disciples. Mm. Yeah. Were together. <laughs> that makes seven. And you I can try find to that tell you. In John yeah. 21, verse 2. Very good. Yeah. All Breakfast right. by the sea with Jesus. Yeah, that would have been Doesn't good. Doesn't that sound lovely? It does sound very nice. One and of it's these early days. morning, so probably One not a lot of people days. were around. You know, it was just them. That was great. It was beautiful. I can't think of that. that. That would be beautiful. If you haven't read John 21 today, read John 21 today and just think about that scene. Beautiful. Yeah, because on the next program, we go into the book of Acts. Acts.